Hello, welcome to Chapter 5 of Financial Statement Analysis. In this particular chapter, we're going to discuss intercorporate investments. And intercorporate investments take several forms. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about intercorporate investments. You have two different types, uh, a little bit of an overview of the topics. You have investment securities, you have different types of investment securities, different methods for recording them. And we're going to talk about in detail about the equity method of accounting securities, what happens with business combinations, which is really going to be acquisitions and a few other things. We're going to touch on derivative securities and then finally talk about the fair value option. Uh, what are the two main, in, uh, re what is the main reason for analyzing market investment securities? Really what you're talking about here is something that is on the balance sheet where a business invests in either debt securities or equity securities. And the reason we want to do that is we're trying to uh, segregate between operating and investing performance for the business. And in some regards, financing as well. And what we want to do is take those investing performance numbers outside of what's happening within the business. We want to segregate those numbers to make certain we understand exactly what's happening in the business and what is operating and what is non-operating. Uh, we, we want to analyze the distortions from the securities. and We want to make certain that we know where the gains and losses are that are relative to those securities. What are the two main types of marketable securities? What's the composition of them? We have both debt securities, which would be primarily bonds, and equity securities, which are stocks. Um, what are the examples of the marketable uh, securities? We already touched on this. Um, but what we want to talk about next is something that talks about this um, accounting for securities, ASC 320 and ASC 825. They changed or they altered how we account for investment securities. You no longer put them on your books at lower of cost or market. Accounting is determined by their classification. What we're talking about here is if they're trading securities, marketable securities, or held to maturity. And we're going to touch on that just a little bit. And you notice we no longer do it at cost or fair market. The decision bends on, on these three things. The type of security, what management intends to do when they're owning the security, and also the degree of control and influence. And there's certain percentages or guidelines that have been established for those. So what you have at the composition a little bit lower level detail is you have investment securities. This is just a diagram of those. You have both debt securities and equity securities. And you have investment securities at the top part. But you notice in debt securities you have three kinds. You have held to maturity, trading, and available for sale. And if you notice on the equity side, you have no influence below 20% holding, but you see it has those same categories, trading and available for sale under equity securities. Then you have something that says that you have the significant influence, 20 to 50%, and controlling influence. So each one of those are classifications based off of what an organization intends to do with a specific type of security, either debt or equity. Now here's kind of a broad stroke look at these. And you notice you have held to maturity. What happens? Uh, security is required with both the intent and ability to hold to maturity. You're going to amortize their cost on the balance sheet. You're not rec you don't recognize a net income or a gain lo or loss or do anything comprehensive income. And you only represent the gain or loss uh, on the income statement when you actually do that, when you sell. The next one, trading. Securities acquired mainly for short-term or trading purposes. So it's like you might think like a day trader. You carry them on the balance sheet at fair value. You recognize in net income, but you recognize realized. Uh, you only recognize it when it's realized. And you notice here it says unrealized gains or loss. You recognize that in the net income, so you estimate that. And then when you sell it, you do the net income in interest income on the balance on the income statement. The last one available for sale. Security is neither held for trading nor held to maturity. You put them at fair value. It's not recognized in the income statement until uh, it's put it's recognized in comprehensive in income. And then you notice that you recognize a gain or loss on the income statement when you sell it. That's this last column here. What are the classifications? This is for equity securities, not debt, but equity. So let's take a look here. The key categories here they line up the top four. And you notice you have this first cat. There's actually three categories. 
The first one is really no influence, and you have available for sale or trading. Then you have significant influence or controlling influence. Each one of these has separate accounting. If you work our way down, available for sale, the biggest difference here is what's their purpose, and then it drives what their accounting is. So available for sale security has long or intermediate is a longer intermediate investment and you report that in, in, in comprehensive income whereas trading is short term or trading and you report that in net income and then when you report you put it in net income or net loss on the balance sheet now the significant influence one is a little bit different that means that they control a significant influence they have between 20 and 50 percent share of the stock uh, versus the 20 percent you see here below so they have considerable business influence they can actually impact what happens. You need to record this at the equity method and we'll go through at least at some level a certain amount of how you calculate the equity method. Now is there an income or loss? It's not recognized. It only is recognized in the balance sheet as far as what's happening. And then if you have a controlling interest it's greater than 50 percent and you actually do a consolidation and there's whole classes that are set up as consolidations or business consolidations that you'll get a little bit more detail on but that gives you a pretty good idea. Okay, we're going to talk specifically about the equity method, which is remember 20 to 50 percent, and <coughs> excuse me, and you can exert significant influence, but um, over the investee, and they report their parents, they report their parents stuff on the balance sheet, and generally it's for 20 to 50 percent. Okay and we're going to put it in an investment account as it originally initially recorded at acquisition cost and you increase by you increase the value of that acquisition account cost by the investee earnings and you decrease it by dividends and this is something you probably covered in your principles one class way back when and probably again in intermediate one and the income is part of the equity and you show it as a reduction in investment these two are pretty much kind of the same so let's take a look here at an equity method deal. It says here, assume that global corporation acquires for cash 25% interest in Synergy for $500,000, representing one-fourth or 25% of course of Synergy's equity on acquisition date. So on the global's books, it's $500,000 and $500,000. On Synergy, you don't see anything. Even though global owns a good portion, this, this $500,000, and this isn't laid out right, the cash should be over here as a credit. But really on um, on Synergy's books, there's no impact. But now let's go to the next slide. Um, subsequent to, date, to the acquisition date, Synergy reports net income up to $100,000. So remember that the, if you go back, Global had 25% interest. So what Global would do for this first one is they would put they would increase their investment account $25,000 or 25% of the $100,000. And then what they would do is they would reduce it by the stock, the, um, the stuff that paid out, right? The dividends that were paid out. So you have an increase on their books and then a decrease as well for the, for the dividends that were paid out or 25%. This particular dividend is going to be the 25 percent is going to be going to cash when they have investments because they're going they're going to get a check for that but the other 25,000 goes here okay and you notice what it says here's the first 25,000 investments and then there's the other half equity earnings and then 5,000 in cash and the 5,000 this 5,000 really is representative of receipt of dividends nothing changes on synergies books except for the net income and the dividends that were paid out. So we're doing an equity method. So what are some of the important points? The investment account reported as e is equal to the amount of the proportionate share of the share of the stockholders equity. So that's where we had that 25 percent. Substantial assets and liabilities may not be recorded on the balance sheet unless the investee is consolidated. So there's it's not a consolidation. Investment earnings should be distinguished from core operating earnings. Why is that? Because you don't want to have those earnings separate, uh, included in other earnings because they're not part of the core business. Let's say my company bought a, um, oh, I don't know, just another company uh, that, uh, a pro, uh, just another company. Investments are reported at, at adjusted cost, not market value. So what did they cost? And you should discontinue 
the investment uh, when the investment is reduced to zero and should not provide for additional losses unless the investor is guaranteed. What this really says is that you shouldn't do this after you have your less than 20%. Um, and, and that's it for that slide. So business combinations are a little bit different. Now what we're doing, not the equity method, where you are only up to 50%. This is greater than 50%. And we're going to talk about the accounting for this here in a minute. But basically what happens is you're combining two companies for several different reasons. And it might be a vertical acquisition, which means that you're uh, acquiring a company that's up or down in your supply chain. Maybe you're a, a poultry company and you acquire a feed company. That would be an, a vertical acquisition. Maybe you're a, a box company and you acquire a paper company that's going to supply you with the papers. But what we're trying to do is these are all the different things that can happen. It can enhance the value. One of the things that companies might do is they might buy a brand that they didn't have before. More financial resources, it might strengthen their management team. Maybe there's some people in that other company that are really important to you. you might have diversification, a broader sense of, of what they want to do for a business. Uh, it, can, it can get them into a market that they weren't in before. Maybe I'm a dairy company and I don't have any dairies in the Pacific Northwest and I really don't want to build a dairy, but if I go out and buy one, then all of a sudden I can um, establish a dairy in the Pacific Northwest or a foothold there easily. There might be certain tax advantages and you might have prestige and per, uh, perquisites, which I'm not certain what that is, but also man, management compensation. What's so important about that? Managers a lot of times make money only if they grow. So there's all sorts of different things. Um, then what are we going to do? We're going to look at something called the purchase method. And the purchase method is basically taking the assets from the acquired business, the, the fair market value of the assets, and comparing them back to what you paid for the tangible assets. And any difference is going to actually go in this account down here called goodwill. And we'll talk a little bit more about goodwill in a little bit. So we're going to do consolidated financial statements. We're going to do aggregation and elimination. We're going to aggregate the assets and the revenues and everything else. And we're going to have the minority interest. So let's look at this one. On December 31st, year one, Synergy purchases 100% of Micron Company for 10,000 shares, $5 per, per share at $77 market value. So they paid $770,000. On the date of acquisition, the book value of Micron is $620,000. Synergy is willing to pay seven seventy. So basically they paid $150,000 more than what they thought. But this is book value. Now if you notice here, it says Micron feels it feels that Micron's property plant and equipment is undervalued by twenty and it has an unrecorded trademark of thirty. So you get another hundred and fifty thousand. And it says that they can make money, they can improve intangible benefits of a hundred thousand. So these things all come into play. And Typically, when it says feels, that's really not a good thing because what they'll actually do is use an independent uh, evaluator to find out what the value of the true assets are for the company that's acquired. They'll do a, they'll have an independent appraisal done. But let's see what happens here. So this is the purchase price. This is what it looks like. They paid seven seventy. The book value is six twenty. They had one hundred fifty thousand dollars in excess. But what they know is they have twenty thousand dollars in undervalued property, plant, and equipment. $30,000 in, in um, trademark and the other stuff is what they call goodwill and goodwill is going to be an asset on the balance sheet and you notice it has an indefinite useful life and these are useful lives of these assets that they're going to deal with so what they want to do is after the first year they're going to have 770 they're going to have an investment income of 150,000 zero dividends and 8,000 in amortization so the number is going to look at 912 okay so now here is a consolidated set of financial statements. They're not, they're not, we didn't do purchase accounting yet, but we did a consolidated set of financial accounting. So what you have is they still have separate and distinct standalone businesses, but you have a consolidated set of financial statements. A couple things that are important here. Some of the intercompany transactions are going to eliminate, and some of this in investment income. So remember it was 150 less than 8, so 142. And you can kind of work your way down all this stuff and see what happens for each particular business. And you have an idea what's going on with the, within the business. But this is in year two. So they do consolidated financial statements, but they don't combine them. They do consolidated, but not combined. And um, they might do that for several different reasons. They might want it to be a wholly owned subsidiary. So the business combinations 
Uh, if you look at the consolidation entries, these show you the different consolidation entries. 620,000 in be initial investment, 150, and the initial investment went to the fair market value account. You have an elimination um, of the income from Micron, and you record the depreciation of the fair market value of adjustment. And there's, and you notice on the bottom here, there's no amortization of goodwill under GAAP. The income statement, these two are combined. That's the first one says. Uh, the depreciation amortization is recorded as an additional expense in the consolidated income statement. If there's intercompany profits and inventory, those get eliminated. The equity investment account on Synergy's balance sheet is replaced with Micron assets. So one offsets the other. The liabilities reflect the book value of the Synergy plus the, the book value of the Micron. And the goodwill is just the difference between the two. What's the impairment to goodwill? Goodwill is, is impaired. Um, they, they record this goodwill. The fair market value of Micron is compared with the book value of the associated income account on Synergy's books. That's what goodwill is actually established. The current market value is less than the initial investment balance. Goodwill is deemed as impaired, and impaired loss must be recorded in the consolidated income statement. And the, there's rules for doing this impairment, but that a portion of the goodwill contained on Synergy's investment account is written off in the balance in the goodwill consolidated balance sheet is reduced accordingly. So what they're doing is they're saying they paid all this extra money for a business, but it doesn't add, but goodwill is impaired, so they have to write some of it off. It'd be no different. A prime example of that is maybe you bought a particular brand of a business and you realize that um, that once you've bought that brand, you're going to consolidate or get rid of that brand. Well, then that brand becomes impaired, and so does goodwill, so you have to write off the goodwill. Um, so you have contingent consideration and allocation of total cost. These are all just different things that you want to look at in business combinations. Um, contingent consideration, uh, based off of the purchase agreement, you're going to allocate total cost and in-process research and development and debt and consolidated financial statements. You want to report those. Some more, you have gain on subsidiary stock sales, the consequences of goodwill accounting, which we touched on, and push down accounting is how the acquired company from purchase reports assets and liabilities and separate financial statements. If it stands alone as a separate entity. Limitations on consolidated of consolidated financial statements. Consolidated Consolidated financial statements don't reveal restrictions on the use of cash for individual companies. Um, and they also don't show intercompany cash flows. Companies in for, poor financial conditions sometimes combine with strong companies to kind of hide their analysis or mess it up. And the in, extent of intercompany transactions is unknown because you can't see it in the consolidated process. Uh, and accounting for the consolidated and financial insurance companies is, is confusing or challenging. Consequences of accounting for goodwill. Superior competitive advantage is subject to change. That means there might it really is telling you goodwill is not permanent. Residual goodwill, you have measurement problems. Timing of goodwill it is really not accurate. It's generally it doesn't follow very well with the matching principle. In many cases, goodwill is nothing more than a mechanical application of the accounting rules. In other words, what did you pay versus what did you get and what's the difference? That's goodwill. And, and the goodwill on a balance sheet is really not reflective of the intangible earnings power of a business. Pooling accounting, which went away in 2001, but the, in the pooling method, the investment account is debited for the purchase price under the pooling method. This debit is the amount of the book value of the acquired companies. Assets are not written up from the historical balances on the investee balance sheet. And therefore, there is no goodwill. There's the avoidance of goodwill. That's the whole concept. Now, remember, you can't do this since June 30th, 2001. Background. Let's talk about derivative securities. You have hedges. And um, hedges are contracts that seek to insulate companies from market risks, uh, such as futures, options, swaps are used as hedges. So they're trying to mitigate their risk and ensure that they're going to take delivery of certain things that they need appropriately at a given price. So they're trying to mitigate risk. That's what they really are. Derivative securities are derivatives of these same things on the top, but they're a lot different because they deal with more with stock and bond and commodity prices and interest rates and current rate exchanges. And they can expose companies to considerable risks, and that's one of the things that happened with Enron. There was something called FAS 133 that came out from that because Enron did a whole lot of derivatives. 
You have futures. Futures are an agreement between two or more parties to purchase or sell a certain commodity, so like corn or soy, or a financial asset at a future date called a settlement date at a given price. So what they're trying to do, a lot of businesses are trying to lock in what they are going to pay for the raw materials. Think of Coca-Cola determining how much corn they're going to buy to make sweet um, to make uh, corn syrup to make Coca-Cola. That might be an example. A swap is an agreement between two or more parties to exchange future cash flows for hedging risks, especially interest rate and foreign exchange, foreign currency risks. Oh, let me go back. Hold on just a moment. An option uh, grants a party not the obligation, the right, not the obligation to execute a transaction. A call option is the right uh, to do that, but a put option is a, to sell a security or commodity to at a different settlement date. Here's kind of a, a graph of different types of derivatives for accounting and what happens with each one of them. Some are hedges, some are speculative. Speculative ones have the highest risk. These hedges are trying to mitigate risk, but these ones, the speculative ones, are the ones that have the highest risk. So when you're looking at your financial analysis, you want to look at speculative risk. Um, what do we have for speculative? You, how you deal with each one of these, and I'm not going to read through all this, this just gives you a guide about how you're going to do this. And this is Exhibit 5.7 in your book and how it's supposed to be accounted for. And you have derivative securities. You have disclosures. You have both qualitative, which are non-numbered disclosures, and, and quantitative, which are numbered disclosures. This particular one has to do with Campbell Super. And you want to read through this and just understand what they're doing. Some companies really avoid derivative securities, and some companies really embrace them. The oil and gas industry is really strong for derivative securities. But you would want to read through these relative to your particular business that you're analyzing. Also, you want to. So, what you want to do when you're analyzing? Identify the objectives of why they're using the derivatives. What is the risk and exposure of their hedging strategies? Are they really good at this? Or are they not? Some businesses are terrible. Uh, what's a specific company-wide risk for doing this? And is it included in operating or non-operating income? Depending upon this one, this bottom one. And this one on the top really truly relate to one another. If they're trying to use, uh, actually this next one, this risk, all three of these, they all really relate to how they're going to do stuff within a business and where they operate, the, where they put the gains or loss for using those securities. So you have the fair value option, eligible assets and liabilities and investments and debt and equity securities and various financial applications. It's not allowed for subsidiaries and their sub selective application. Uh, for it with uh, flexibility for fair value option on individual assets and liabilities. And what happens? The carrying amount of the asset or liability on the balance sheet will always be at fair value of the at the measurement date. All changes in the fair value of the asset, including unrealized gains or loss, will be included in net income. You can choose to, re you can choose to report the unrealized gain or loss differently from the cash flow, depending upon what happens. And, and Analysis and implications for the fair value option. Reliability of fair value measurements. And it's opportunistic application. An analyst needs to verify, and that's you in this case, whether the fair value election has been opportunistic with an aim to window dress the financial statements. This is one where they can play with their numbers a little bit. And he talks about this accounting principle called consistency. So you want to look at that relative to the fair value option. That's it for the Chapter 5 lecture. Um, we'll go to chapter six here in just a little bit. I hope things are going well for you. I'll talk to you later. Bye.